Yeah, okay, we will start in two minutes. Just let's sort out um, the cropping issue. Uh, so our slides are a bit cropped in the stream. I'm actually drawing. And this is what Google uses to be able to train this neural network that they have. They sort of crowdsource these, the, uh, their data sets. So they don't really um, have you know, data of people's drawings and they just push them inside a neural network. It may sound like, like Chinese, what I'm saying, but essentially they use our drawings to train their AI to, to recognize doodles. So you saw the first time I drew just the top one the second one of the hamburger using examples. So like we said, we can't possibly create if statements for every possible example in the world. No, we train a model using examples. So, and we keep on fixing this model, we um, test it, we make it better until it looks really good and it works great. That's really the idea behind machine learning. Taking this need for us to sort of code every single case and only training our model on a set of cases, on a data set, and then being able to really have a sort of output or an intelligent model. So, so now this is really the broadest way you can describe machine learning. And uh, hopefully that's sort of clear to you. Um, it, does anyone have any question based on the like, difference between rule-based and, uh, and ML and machine learning? No? Okay. So this is like um, a sort of way for you to test your understanding of this. We're just gonna very quickly go through these before we really move on to the real stuff, so the code and all that. Um, but yeah, let's talk about them. So if you're alphabetizing a list of song titles, would you go for a rule-based if statement approach or for a machine learning approach? Do you really need AI to change things, to sort them in alphabetic order? Not really. We know how sorting works because um, most of us are really familiar with sorting. It's really some loops, some if statements, you know, according to the first letter, this is very easy. This is a beginner uh, coding. So no, we don't really need AI. This is rule-based. If we wanna rank web search results according to recommendations, according to different statistics, this is actually a combination of both. Now this one maybe is a bit ambiguous, but we'll move on to maybe a more um, clear one that really draws the distinction between rule-based and machine learning-based. If we want to predict housing prices based on location, so I want to predict how much it will cost to buy a house in California in the summer um, with five bedrooms and two bathrooms. Okay, that's a weird combination, but okay. And I want to know like exactly how much that will cost me based on the previous data of all the houses in California. So are you really seeing it? So we can't obviously program a certain uh, program to really know the housing prices for every single house, but it can predict them based on, you know, a larger data set of, of samples in that area. So in California, that's really the goal. That's really where ML um, steps away from rule-based and shows us this distinction. 
Now, if we want to process online payments, now what do we mean by process online payments? Basically, we just mean um, like you know taking them in and then running them through this program to deduct this um, amount from your balance. And that's really easy. If statements, variables, it's basic program. So yeah, that should be um, enough. So classifying an object in a photo, this one for sure is machine learning. Why is that? It's because you really cannot tell a computer every single object in the world how it looks like. So I could say tiger, but there are like a billion tigers all over the world. I don't know how many tigers there are. Um, whatever it is, they may look a bit different. So you can't say this is a tiger. Or you may even catch the same tiger at like different angles, make it look different. So this is why we use AI. Um, just some applications. So just recapping, rule-based approach, rules are defined, and then improvements come directly into the code. Machine learning, no, it learns from the data and it gets, it improves itself based on the actual data. So each has its, uh, you could say, own benefits. All right, so how do we really take these ideas, these concepts we learned? I'm just going to skip over the videos. This is the main, the broadest way you can define a machine learning process. So, okay, we focus on the user. We want to provide, uh, um, you know, uh, really focus on the goal. So what does the user really want from us? Then we define a goal, an objective. So here, let's say my goal, I want to recognize street lights. Like I'm, the, I'm my client is a person making a self-driving car. I want to recognize street lights or whatever. I collect data. So, you know, no machine learning can learn without data. Okay, you will always need data, you will need tons of data. The reason machine learning is so popular these days is because of how much data there is on the internet. Every click of every button you've ever made on any website is recorded as data about you. So don't be freaked out. Because like, for example, Google. Um, Google knows that you uh, went to this website, you clicked on this image, then you search for another website, and it's using all of this information to create better recommendations and better sites to show you for yourself. So it's not technically spying. It's their way of using your data, your information, to make your experience on the internet much better for you. Then you take this data, you create a machine learning model, and then you train and you test it. Then you keep on testing it and training it, and you repeat. And as you repeat, your model gets better and better. So that's really um, okay. Skipping the videos. That's really it. What can machine learning do? Or just like a brief um, here, like a brief concept. Artificial intelligence is a very hard term to define. It really encompasses everything from machine learning to robotics to literally anything that can mildly be AI will be classified as AI. So it's really not the most technical term that you can use. So really, no one has a PhD in artificial intelligence. Um, most of the time, it's a PhD in machine learning. So keep that in mind if that's like a future career choice for you. Now, for machine learning, like we said, we have this data. We want to make predictions based on this data. We want to make decisions. Deep learning is another subset, neural networks. We'll be discussing this next week in a collaboration with the AI Club. OK, so what does ML use? It uses technology, data, and algorithms to make everything. Some types of ML. There are different types of machine learning, um, and we're just gonna go over them very quickly. Our main, like the, the main topic of this event is actually classification. So what is classification? You're classifying something. So here I have an image of a lion. I am classifying this guy, this thing right here, as a lion, and I'm classifying it as a mammal or whatever. You can see from the image, it's sort of classifying dots as being either red or blue. And that's really how classification works. I could you know, show it a picture of an animal and it will tell me whether this is a cat or a dog. Or I can you know, show it my email and it will tell me whether this email is a spam mail or a legitimate email that I need to take into account. So that's how classification works. Now, binary classification is classifying two classes. So you know, spam or not spam. Or you have like multi-class classification. Don't worry about those terms. But this means basically, you know, this is a dog. Um, this is a cat, this is a bird, this is, you know, like multiple different things. Binary is two things, spam or not spam. That's how you should think of it. Regression is very similar to classification. It uses old data to sort of predict numerical values. So this is what you would do for predicting housing prices or prices for a flight or the duration of a flight. So this is just like classification, but this is for numbers. 
classification is for classes or labels. Clustering is basically grouping together similar data. Don't worry about clustering for now. This is a different part of uh, machine learning that we will maybe cover one day in another event, or maybe the AI club will cover it. Uh, we'll see. Sequence prediction is basically just learning from um, different sequences. So how things happen together or how things happen, you know, following each other. Style transfer is something like that. So this is a very specific application um, of machine learning. So it's taking the, slide, the styles of two different um, images and applying them. So that's really it. Now, I will go through these super quickly so that we can really move on. But um, what type of machine learning would you need to recommend what someone will download based on their previous predictions, uh, previous purchases? So I already answered this, but this is sequence prediction. So we know that this person, okay, they buy shoes. And every time they buy shoes, they buy um, a matching wallet or something, okay? So next time they're gonna buy shoes, we're gonna recommend a matching wallet or we know that they like this specific brand, so we're gonna recommend stuff from this brand, things like that. So if you've ever used Amazon, when you check out, they tell you customers usually buy these things together, or maybe you will also like this, you should also buy it. So this, these are recommender systems. Email as spam or not spam, we said this is classification. Identifying trend, trends amongst a group of people who have bought a new music release. This is clustering, I said, don't worry about it. Captioning a video. Um, style transfer, determining workout activity based on phone movement. So this is also classification. Um, this is multi-class classification. So um, my phone is either bouncing up and down or going left and right, and this would help me determine what I'm really doing, um, and so on. So we can go on and on with these examples. So if you want, we'll share these slides and you can go through them uh, yourself. So that's it really for this, you know, little introduction. Now to just um, sort of define machine learning more formally, we just have to say machine learning systems, they take inputs, which are this data, they make useful predictions and decisions about previously unseen pieces of data. So they take all these images of dogs, they learn how to identify dogs, and then I bring in an image of a new dog and it tells me this is a dog. And it's a specific field of AI where a system learns how to find patterns. That's really how we like to define it. And also, this is a very popular definition of machine learning. It's probably one you should know by heart. Um, computers learn learning how to do a task without explicitly being programmed to do so. So we said the classical rule-based programming. We're explicitly telling a computer, you know, when you do, when you see this, do this. When I, when this is green, this is actually grass. Something like that. In the case of machine learning. No, we're not explicitly programming the computer to do it. We're actually teaching it and then it's, being, uh, it's doing it on its own. Okay, um, if there are any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box and uh, we'll take them up. All right. Okay, so like we said, this is just a summary of things that ML can do. Um, and these are more examples of machine learning. Now machine learning does come in two types. So this is an important distinction. Before I spoke about multiple, um, you know, different types of machine learning like classification, regression, and all those things. But they do fall under different categories and machine learning is really into two main categories. So supervised versus unsupervised. Supervised, you're training on labeled data. What do we really uh, mean by that? So, uh, okay, no. Okay, so supervised labeled data. What does this mean? This means I will give my, um, you know, I will give my program, my ML model, a bunch of photos of dogs, but all of them have a label. So they are labeled as dog photos. So this is dog one, dog two, dog three, with unsuper, and then I do bring a new one, and uh, the new one will really, I will give them a new photo of the dog, and then it will identify the dog in the new photo. With unsupervised, the model learns from unlabeled data. What does unlabeled data mean? Unlabeled data is basically, here are a thousand pictures of a dog. I'm gonna give you a new picture of a dog and you're gonna be able to recognize that these are parts of the same thing. It's gonna sort of group things that are alike together. Again, don't really worry in that regard. Unsupervised is not part of this event. Um, okay, I'm not gonna cover loss, okay. And I'm just gonna scroll through this, okay. So, 
Um, one last thing. Okay, so how are we going to, to frame our problems? So how do we frame a machine learning problem? What do we mean by framing an ML problem? We mean that later on, so now, you know, you're always trying to, to have a goal when you're working on projects. You have a bunch of handwritten digits and you want to be able to recognize them and give out the real type digit, right? Okay, here you know your problem. Later on, if you become, you know, someone who's working with machine learning, you're going to have a bunch of data. You're going to need to identify a problem, frame it, and then work on it. Okay, so here's some terminology before you actually are able to frame your problem. A label is the thing that we are predicting. So if I have, you know, all these photos of dogs, they're labeled as dog. I'm predicting that these photos will actually be dogs. This is really what a label is. You know, it's like when you write something on a tag and you like stick it as a sticker and you're like, this is the late, this is actually ketchup. Something like that. Um, on the other hand, features. Features are actually things describing our data. So now I'm going to assume I'm predicting housing prices. So I'm predicting the price, right? And I want to use all this data I have to predict the price. Some features in this case would be things like how many bedrooms it has how many bathrooms it has, how many, um, like the location, is it on the street, does it have a backyard? These are all features, information. So you know for yourself, when you look in the mirror, your features are your face, your eyes, your nose. Those are features. They describe you as a person, as, as an entity. This is the sort of exact same idea. You know, th this data describes this thing. An example is one instance of the data. So this is like one dog. From, from all the photos of dogs. A labeled example, this is for supervised ML. This is what we use to train our data. So what do we mean in this case? I have a picture of a dog and why the label is actually the dog, uh, the label dog, the word dog. Unlabeled example, I have a picture. I have no idea what's inside it. Um, you know, I'm about to find out, if you could say that. And the model is like the whole ML algorithm is what really does um, the magic, you could say, okay? And how do you really follow a scientific method? So when you frame your problem, this is the last thing I'm gonna cover and then we're gonna hit uh, the code. So to frame the problem, you have to decide like a question that you're asking. For example, what will traffic be like tomorrow? So how does you know Google Maps predict the traffic? Then we make a hypothesis. So the weather forecast could you know help me identify the traffic. So you can, if tomorrow it's going to rain so heavily and the rain is just going to be like storming, I can, you know, expect most people will not really leave the house unless they're forced to. So I collect some data. I collect some data regarding, you know, the weather and the traffic. So, you know, on the days last year when the weather was really good, how was the traffic? How was it when the weather was bad? I test my, my hypothesis. Um, so it should act actually say that uh, I perform all of the, you know, I actually, you know, put this in my model and I actually test it and see how it works with the older data. I analyze my results. So is this model really working? Is it giving the correct answers? To do so, we, re we really use some testing data. So we'll go into training and testing data later. So it's okay if you're a bit confused. To reach a then we reach a conclusion about the model. So maybe this model is doing well, it's not doing that well. And if it's predicting well, then it's good. And we keep on refining it until we actually like it. And at the end of the day, what do we get? We get um, that the time of year could be a helpful signal. So if it's, you know, December and there's a storm, the time of year could be really helpful. Um, okay. And that's really the steps for you to frame your problem. So you, you know, you have a problem, you put a goal, you have some data, you make some predictions. That's really it. And um, these are just some examples. So a beekeeper wants to analyze pictures of their honeybees and identify their role within their colony. So how does this work? Um, to do so, they also use a machine learning model. A teacher wants to predict a student's end of year test results based on a student's performance on many tests throughout the year. So she takes the student's data, and does the promotion, the prediction, sorry. And then an organization, um, no, this is from your end, so we're gonna uh, skip that. 
Okay, so that's it from my end. That's sort of an introduction. Does anyone have any question before we move on to the code and Iyad will take over? No? Okay. Um, just a quick note. So the stream is back on. So it has been back on for a while now. So people are watching on YouTube. Um, to those people, you can feel free to join here. You can feel free to keep on watching there. Uh, also for you guys, if you're more comfortable with YouTube, you can go there. So it doesn't really matter. We're still streaming. Uh, okay, so I'm going to stop sharing and Iyad will take over. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, I'm Iyad and uh, we'll be looking at uh, multiple machine learning algorithms today. Um, let me share my screen. Just give me a second. Okay, so um, the first algorithm we'll be looking at is actually called K nearest neighbors. It's a pretty simple, straightforward algorithm for machine learning, but still it's one of the, it's a very used and very useful algorithm. How does it work? Um, in simple sense, k nearest table says, if my neighbors look like me, then I'm one of my neighbors. Say, for example, you know, we have multiple images of cats and dogs. I look at an image. You, try, you compare it. Does this look like a cat or a dog? What's what is its closest to? Okay, it matches a cat. So it must be a cat. It's resembling, it resembles those multiple cats. Okay, uh, the main parameter in k-nearest neighbors algorithm is actually the number of neighbors is compared to. The more neighbors uh, a data point is compared to, the higher the accuracy. But as a trade-off, we'll be using more computational time to be able to determine the, the class of the data point. Okay, so let's take a basic example before we actually get into the code. Let's say, uh, let's say we're trying to determine the t-shirt size of a per person based on their height and weight. Okay, we have previous existing data about the heights and weights of multiple people and the t-shirt size they wear. We can take our measurements, those are our features, from the person we're looking to match the t-shirt size to and compare it to the actual weights and heights. For comparison, we just consider, say, the weight and the height are an x and a y axis, and we compute the Euclidean distance between those two points. Say, in this case, we have, we're comparing to the, fi the five nearest neighbors. K is equal to five. In this case, we choose the five neighbors that have the closest Euclidean distance to our subject. Once we know that, we can check the t-shirt size of those subjects. As we can see here, we have four of them that wear a medium and one that wears large. This means that most probably our subject should wear a medium t-shirt as its closest neighbors are mainly medium. Okay. So let's get into the code actually. Let me switch to this. Okay, so the data set we'll be working on today is actually one of iris flowers. Basically, we have three types of iris flowers, and we're looking to classify, to given an unknown flower, classify it under one of those three types. So um, to start with, we'll be using a library called Scikit-Learn. It includes many tools for machine learning, including ready-made models. This way, you only need to worry about actually preparing your data, not about the actual mass behind the machine learning models. So let's get started. Let's definitely import our libraries first. So we can import NumPy as MP, as we always do. And we can import from scikit-learn our neighbors classifier and data sets. So from um, sklearn, import neighbors and data sets. Okay, so we run our imports. Uh, wait, a scale, that. scale learn. Learn, yep, okay, good. Okay, second thing we're going to do is to actually get our data set. Scikit-learn actually makes it convenient for us and includes a few data sets built into it that we can use for experimentation. One of them is this iris data set. So let's just call it. 
we can do iris is equal to data sets dot load iris. Okay, and let's print out our data set. Okay, as you can see here, this data set doesn't really make sense. It's a bunch of cluttered data with lots of information. We actually need to find a way to make sense of this data to understand it and know what features do we need to use to into our, to feed into our machine learning model and to perform predictions. For this, actually, we can use pandas. So let's turn this data into a data frame to conveniently visualize it. So, okay. So let's go back up here to our imports and actually import pandas as PD. So let's run that again. And let's come back here. Let's create a data frame. Data frame equals PD dot data frame. Okay, in this case, we want to load up the data and the labels from our data set. In this case, for the RS data set, um, give, according to the scikit learn documentation, we know that data is stored in a variable, uh, is basically under the, ta the tag data. So data is equal to iris data. And we also have our labels. Um, and scikit and panels, we actually need to call it columns which is equal to iris and basically targets. Targets are our target prediction. So, and we can print out this data frame. Okay. Uh, target, target, not target, my bad. No, oh, again. Uh, let me just double check. Oh, um, I think I had that wrong. Nope, what, what's going on here? Data frame data. Oh, okay, 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 my bad, my bad, my bad. Feature names here, yep. So, yep, okay, we're good. Um, so here we just loaded up our I create a data uh, pandas data frame from our existing data. Right here, we can see that our data provides us with multiple flowers with their sepal lengths, their sepal widths, their petal lengths, and their petal widths as numeric values measured in centimeters. Okay, one more useful thing to have in this case would be the actual type of flower. In the um, and the iris data set, basically the items are labeled as either zero, one, or two. So let's add those labels to our data frame here. What I'll do is here to mp.c iris data and iris targets. Yep, and I'll just add a label here that says tar target. Okay, so if we invalid syntax iris plus target. Oh, okay, okay, oh, my bad here again. So let's not. Um, wait, what am I doing? Okay, okay, so we're good. Um, basically, we just added a column here that shows the target. Basically, is this flower, what type of iris is this flower? Is it type zero, type one, or type two? based on its sepal and petal lengths. Okay, we visualized our data. Now we need to actually start preparing it to feed into our ML algorithm. For this, we need to split our data set into two packs, into a training set and a testing set. To do this, what we can do is just load up the, the RS data sets into NumPy and just do a, perform a lay slicing on it. So let's let's create x train, which will be equal to a uh, which will be equal to iris dot data. Uh, for this example, our first example, I'll just be taking the first two columns, the sepal lengths and sepal widths, to work with. In this case, the data structures inside the iris to have to basically have every row represent a flower, 
and every column is the second degree array in NumPy. So we can just slice it by using get me all rows and the all columns up to column two, like we checked out in our last event. Um, actually, let's make this be our X data, our complete X data, and let's have our Y data equal iris dot targets dot target, uh, and we'll taking all we'll be taking all the targets. If we come here and actually print X, let's say capital X, it prints it out the first two columns of our data set, basically sepal lengths and sepal widths. We can also print Y, which will print out our labels. Now we need to split off this data set into two packs. So let me let's create a new variable called X train, which will be equal basically to the first 120 data points of our Aris data set. Our Aris data sets contains 150 data points. Uh, basic rule of thumb is when doing machine learning, give your training and testing data an 80-20 split. Have 80% be for training and 20% be for testing and validating the model and make sure you do not have any overlapping data between training and testing. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'll be taking here the first 120 data points from X and same for Y, Y train equal to, um, let's see here, X and Y to 120. We can also define our X test to be equal to X from uh, 120 and over basically, and y test equal to y from 120 till the end. We now have our training and testing data set split. Okay, so let's pr print this out. Let's print out our y test, our y test labels, and run this thing. As you can see here, actually, all of these labels are twos. This is because our data set is actually sorted. The elements come in order from top, from being of type zero to type two. So what we can do in this case is to actually shuffle the, all these elements. To do that, we'll be also using NumPy. Uh, what we can do here is after defining our X and Y, we can create a list of shuffled indexes, indices. So let's call shuffled indices is equal to mp.random.permutations and we'll give it the len of our X data set. Basically, this will create a list of permutated indexes that has the same size as our X data set. Then if we, actually, if we do this, X is equal to X shuffled indexes. This would shuffle the index, all the elements in X according to this random order. We can also apply the same thing to the Y axis. Note here that it's, we're actually using the same shuffling index indices for both. This means that the actual match between X data matching Y data doesn't change. This is essential to be able to train the machine learning model as we need to make sure that our X data matches its label. If the labels are incorrect, then the whole model won't behave as expected. So if we run this again here, uh, permute yep my bad you can see here we've now our testing model actually has data from all the three classes of flowers okay now that we have our data prepared we can actually start doing machine learning on it to do that we can we need to call up our scikit-learn library and create an instance of our k nearest neighbors classifier as we said before, the main parameter in a k-nearest neighbor classifier is the number of neighbors we're looking to have next to this data point. Actually, let, let's do something before uh, developing the ML script. Let's plot these points in Matplotlib. This way we can actually visualize how these, these beta lengths and the sepal lengths and sepal widths get, uh, uh, varies between different classes of flowers. Um, so to do that, I'm going to move the train test split later. Um, let me add one, one more of those. And let's do plotting for the entire data set here. So let's import mat, matplotlib.pyplot as plt. And let's set up our plot. So let's 
in this case, we're going to uh, have multiple uh, an XY graph where the x-axis will represent the sepal lengths and the y-axis will represent the sepal widths. And to, uh, to differentiate between different types of flowers, we're going to use different colors. So to do this, we can start by creating a color map. Let's call it scatter C map, scatter C map which is equal to a, list, a listed color map. Color map. This is actually a function in matplotlib. So we definitely need to import that again. So, so from matplotlib.colors import import listed color map. Yep, exactly. Um, let's have our color, our points be orange, cyan, and cornflower blue. Uh, blue. Okay. Now we can. Let's also um, label our axis on the graph. So plt dot x dot x label sepal lengths. And plt dot y label will be sepal widths. Okay, so and let's uh, actually scatter our points. So plt dot scatter. In this case, what will be an, our x and y data? Our x data will be the sepal lengths. So the the first the first column of our x array. The second the y-axis will be the second column of our x array, aka the sepal widths. We can also define C, which is the color, the color index, to be equal to our y data, basically our labels. And we define our color map, C map, to be equal to the scatter C map. So right now, if we plt.show this, we should get the graph representing our, our flowers. Okay, something went wrong. Uh, in fact, RGB argument cornflower blue. So cornflower blue had, had a typo there. And okay, this is our graph. Basically, we have three classes of flowers, the ones in orange, the ones in cyan, and the ones in dark blue. As you can see here, there's actually a clear distinct, um, distinction between, the, you can clearly identify which type of flower it is based on the actual features. This is a very important thing. You need to actually make sure that it's possible to use those features to differentiate between these two values. You can't really, let's say you're comparing, um, let's say you're doing classification on if a car is over speeding, but instead of feeding it as an input, the speed of the car, or say the rotation speed of the motor or whatever, you feed it in just random gibberish, say the color of the sky. It won't, this is not relevant data. It won't be able to be used to perform clear predictions based on this data. So graphing the, and plotting the data helps you really determine if this data is actually clean and ready to be processed by your machine learning model. So let's finally get to this. We did our clean test split. We're good. And let's start creating our classifier. As we said, the main parameter in k nearest neighbors is the number of neighbors we'll we're comparing our para data point to. Let's call this k, k, literally. So let's say here we want to compare each data point to 15 closest neighbors. And let's also uh, create our classifier. To do this, we all have already imported classifiers from uh, the sklearn library. So we'll just make use of that. Let's create a classifier, CLS, classifier, or classifier is equal to classifier, classifier dot, um, basically, uh, I mean, not my, my bad, so near uh, neighbors dot k nearest classifier, yeah. And we pass it on as a parameter, our k value. Okay. Next step to do is to actually train this classifier. Another name for training a machine learning model is fitting the model. You fit this model to your existing training data. So what I'll do here is classifier.fit, and I'll pass it our x train and y train data. So x train, 
x x train and y train okay so here we run that and what we did right now is we actually is we actually trained our classifier with this data but how can we test it how can we know if it's actually behaving and doing what we want this is where the testing data set comes in the testing data set is enough it's basically part and similar to the training data set but the difference is that this is new data the classifier has never actually seen the testing the data points in the testing data set so to test the uh, the accuracy of our classifier what we can do is feed it in the x train the x test i mean the testing the testing features and see what labels it produces then we can compare those feed, those labels to the intended target labels and we'll know how accurate our model is for that actually scikit-learn provides us with a very convenient method. It's called classifier, um, basically classifier dot score. File dot score. And you pass it your X and Y testing data sets. So here we'll give it our X test and our Y test. What what this method will output is basically uh, in, in a float value ranging from zero to one, which is basically the, the accuracy, the percentage accuracy of our model. So let's run this here. And as we can see, this model is 80% accurate. Remember, we're, right now we're feeding it only two data points, the simple length and the simple widths. And given that these two simple points, it's able to actually draw, determine what type of flower this is at an, with an 80% accuracy, which is really impressive. Also note, we're also training this, this model with a really few data set, with a really little, small amount of data sets of points. It's 150 rows. Usually when training models, you could feed them billions of data points for much bigger models. So, okay, let's actually do some predictions. Let's, instead of, score, uh, of scoring our data set, let's actually see what does it output. Let's say, let's tell it to classify, classify dot, dot predict. And we'll pass it, let's say, at first one of the points in our X, X test set. So X test zero. What will this output? Let's run that. Um, contain a single element. Yep, my bad. This is on zero. This means our X test zero is a flower of type zero. It belongs to our first class. Indeed, if we actually print out the value for this, print x test, x test zero, let's do that and run it. Yep, okay, my bad again. If we print x test zero, we can see it's full, it has a sepal length of 5.4 and the sepal width of 3.4. If you go back to our graph, that will force somewhere right here, 5.4 for 5.4 and 3.4, somewhere right here above the graph. Basically, this makes sense for it to be of type, one, of type zero. So our classifier is working correctly. What we can do actually to better visualize this classifier is to feed it a lot, uh, basically a mesh of points, a mesh that a list of points that covers the entire graph. This way we can see if a point lies in which area, what, uh, what class does it belong to according to our trained classifier. So let's come here and, and do that. Um, to do that, I'm going to create a second color map for matplotlib, so let's call this the mesh cmap, which will be, again, a listed color map. Let me get the code from here, but we'll make the colors a bit different so that they're visible. They're visible. So let's go for dark orange, um, C si, sign again, and dark blue. Okay, let's also create our mesh, so basically, XX, YY is equal to NP dot 
mesh grid. We're using NumPy to create a mesh. And uh, to create a mesh, basically, we're feeding it an array of basically two arrays for X and Y of data points. Let's so decide on a mesh resolution. This will determine how um, the, the resolution of a mesh, basically, how smooth it will be. So mesh resolution, so let's say we'll go for 0 0.2. And let's create a grid. So X will be, so we'll take the length of X, X dot min. Basically, we're making sure that the data set, that the mesh grid we're creating actually ranges from the start to the end of our data set. So np dot arrange. X min and X max and with a, with a step size of mesh resolution. Basically, what we're doing here is we're laying out not, uh, points on our X axis that are going from this point, from the minimum value in, in uh, the X zero features to the maximum value in the first feature set, the sepal lengths, with this step size. We can do the same for our Y to create basically a, gr a grid mesh. So here will be our Y data on the plot is actually the sepal width. So the second feature. And let's print, let's actually plot that in matplotlib. Um, so what I'll do here is actually move the plotting from up there to down here. And uh, before plotting our scatter plot, I'm going to plt dot uh, dot pc color dot p color mesh given x x y y uh, mesh prediction yeah okay before doing that we actually need to um to run this mesh through our classifier to actually determine the uh, the prediction of this mesh so let's call let's create a variable called mesh prediction which is basically the labels our classifier has assigned to our mesh values Let's call it mesh labels, actually. Um, OK, this will be equal to classifier, to our classifier, dot predict. predict. And we're going to pass it, basically, an umpire array that contains our, our mesh, our mesh points. So to do that, we're going to do umpire array of xx dot travel. Why the travel? Basically, we're just um, turning this ma this this ma grid mesh we created into two columns, and we're going to transpose it so that every point, so that basically it's rows first. It's an array that where every element is a single row, and perform predictions on that. Now we can plot our mesh labels. Basically, mesh labels will be a value, 0, 1, or 2, which determines the class of the flower. In this case, this will mean what color the flower is. And let's reshape that into xx dot shape. Let's also define our cmap, which in this case will be mesh cmap. And let's run the code. Uh, something is wrong. NumPy has no attribute arrange. It's 1R. Yep. And found array with zero. Okay, let's read on that on top. Found array with zero samples. Okay, still found array of me. Where is our error? A mesh labels on predict. So, oh yeah, my bad. Here, this should be max, and this should be max. Basically, we're going from the minimum to the maximum of. The, from the minimum, we're creating a mesh from the minimum x value to the maximum x value, minimum y value to the maximum y value, and run that. As you can see here, uh, the algorithm, the we can see the actual prediction zones of 
our classifier. Basically, if any point falls within each of the color zone, it will be predicted as the appropriate class. Uh, to better actually view our graph, let's make it a bit more pretty. Um, let's let's just make the bot the point a bit smaller. Let's give it s equal to twenty, and let's add the color to the edge of the point. So edge color is equal to k, so black. What we can also do is actually increase the mesh resolution, which will make the, the graph smoother. So let's do that and run it again. Takes a bit more time to compute, and here you go. Basically, any point that falls within any of these areas will be classified into the appropriate class. Okay. Right now, we're actually performing classification based on two features. What we can, and the accuracy of our model is 76%. It's not that great. It's good enough, but you wouldn't trust that to drive your car, let's say. So what we can do is we can feed it more data. We can, the k-nearest neighbor algorithm actually works with as many features as you want. It doesn't have to be two-dimensional. It can be three-dimensional, feed the three features, four-dimensional, 10-dimensional, uh, 100 dimensions. It works. It will just co still compute the Euclidean distance as before square root of the difference in distance between, and say, x x of your current point minus the x of the neighbor squared, etc. No matter the dimensions you're working on. So to do that, let's actually, uh, let's actually stop printing out, plotting the graph, because we're plotting in 2D, so this will cause some problems. So let me comment these out. And let's go back up and add to our data set here, the two additional columns, basically petal lengths and petal widths. And let's rerun that from that point. So we can rerun, rerun. And we'll rerun everything from, from here. Yep, and as you can see right now, with this new, with those additional data points of the two new features, the classifier is actually 96% accurate, which is perfect. In machine learning, basically, Machine learning basically follows a law of diminishing return. At some point, feeding it more data won't actually make your model better. It will just make it heavier and more bloated. There's even a problem called overfitting, where your model will essentially memorize this data you fed it. So instead of actually of actually comparing and seeing if an object, a data, new data point it has ever seen before is similar to an old one, it will actually just check. Does it perfectly match anyone? No, so that's wrong. This happens when you actually train machine learning models with very, very large data sets, a lot of useless features, and unclean data. This means du duplicate points, points with missing data, etc. So, so yeah, basically that's it here. We have a machine learning model and a few lines of code that can very accurately predict with a 96.666% accuracy what class a flower belongs to based on its sepal lengths, sepal widths, petal lengths, and petal widths. This is really impressive with such a few lines of codes. Imagine actually trying to do that with traditional programming. How, how would you explain those interweaving points here? How would you go about defining conditions to handle all these things? It's a basically impossible. So this is where machine learning comes at play, and this is why machine learning is really useful in processing complex data sets. So other than k-nearest neighbors, we're actually going to talk about two other algorithms. So let me switch back to our presentation notebook. Uh, by the way, any questions before we continue? I know I didn't uh, st stop for questions. Um, okay, everything seems to be okay. Um, let's continue. Okay. So, a second type of classification model is the support vector machine. A support vector machine actually works differently than the k nearest neighbor classifier. Instead of trying to take a point and look what's closest to it, it takes training points and tries to establish a clear boundary between those points. Those points. Say here we have those two clusters of points, of data set points. It will actually try to draw a line that separates this data. But practically a line in two dimensions, you can't really have that much flexibility. 
So instead of using that, support vector machines actually use what's called a hyperplane. A hyperplane is basically can be a polynomial line, a plane in 3D, the equivalent of plane of four dimensions, etc. Basically, it's just a surface that's able to separate this nonlinear data. In this case, let's say this data here is actually linearly separable. So you can just draw a line and separate this data into two groups. You know, whenever this object is left of the line, it belongs to group A. Whenever it's right, it belongs to group B. But say for this type of data, where you actually have um, a lot of data clustered together in the middle and a lot of it that's outside of that, say uh, you could have, um, let's say, a um, let's say if you're checking to if a flower is from a specific type or its parent family, the parent family points would be all over the place, while the specific type would be just inside the small area of your of your plane. So in this case, what you can do is to actually just strap a curve around it. The support vector machine will essentially compute a curve that's actually, that separates those data points from each other and provides a clear boundary. So in this case, whenever you're inside the circle, you're of type yellow. Whenever you're outside the circle, you're of type purple. OK. Those are additional examples about these types of data, non-linearly separable and linearly separable data. Another algorithm in machine learning that's actually really, really silly and simple is a decision tree. Really simple. You just check at every root, at every node, whether it matches this condition or not. But as opposed to your traditional decision tree, which is a list of if statements, in this case, the programmer isn't actually determining what those if statements are checking. But the machine learning model actually decides what feature should fall at each node. Um, let's, um, let's say I'm, comp um, I'm comparing animals. A first check could be, does it fly? Yes, no. If yes, it's a bird. If no, it's, it's a mammal or it's a fish, etc. But given more complex data, it would be really, really hard to program the computer manually to uh, distinct, distinguish between those features. So the so I'm a uh, three-based machine. Based on the data and the provided, it will split them off into a tree. Say those things have matching x-axis values, but different y-axis values for the first and second features, it would split that at the initial node, etc., until it can clearly divide them into classes. One actually one uh, good use of basic tree structures is that simply uh, they can be used to classify classes together. Say Classes A and B are similar, so I can group them together, as you see here. It doesn't have to do clear classification between labels. It can actually find the relationships between those labels and express them in this, um, in this tree, basically. So here we just have an example for, let's say, an animal tree like I was talking about. Does it have feathers? Yeah, true or false. Say it has feathers. Can it fly? If yes, it's a hawk. If no, it's a penguin, etc. Basically, there are a lot more of machine learning models and a lot more complicated things. We have, let's say, a, we have clustering models like um, that k-means, which basically is, tries to establish uh, centroids, points where the data clusters around and tries to actually determine the classes by itself. This is actually a type of unsupervised learning. Um, another thing we have, but for more complex problems, actually, those basic types of ML don't act, are really expensive. They require a lot of computational power to achieve their goals, especially with really huge data sets. So in most, in a lot of cases, we end up using neural networks, which is a most uh, more advanced type of machine learning and the topic of our next event with in partnership with the AI Club. So if you're interested, make sure to tune in next week. Um, any questions?
so we're good. No questions. Okay, so uh, Yad, you're done. So you're on. Um, yep, I think that's it. All right, uh, awesome. Thank you so much, guys, for attending. Um, uh, you know, let us know if you have any other questions. So uh, hopefully, you guys have RSVP'd on the website, so on our platform. Uh, for us to be able to contact you and send you like the material after the um after the session and everything will remain on our youtube channel because uh you know we ended up streaming there so uh don't worry in that regard you can always rewatch our recordings our previous events everything is on the youtube channel and just um one thing if you ever do watch a uh an event of ours on youtube and you feel like you want the material please type it in our Slack or contact us on social media and let us know. So we'll send you the notebook of that event. So we archive everything from all our events. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much again. And uh, you can leave at this point and we can uh, stop streaming. So I'm just gonna, uh, yeah, okay. We're done.